Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the, is it a Soleri report or what do you, what does Dr. Tenpenny call your reports? Oh, I don't. You don't. <laughs> I just, okay. yep, 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 all the time. <laughs> this, is, this is a joint effort. Anyway, but welcome to the Soleri report. I have with me someone who's long been a hero. You've seen her name many, many times. You've heard her name many, many times on the Soleri report. And we finally get to meet. <laughs> Um, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, I, uh, you practice integrative medicine in Ohio. You have a long-standing, very, very successful practice. I heard the other day you described how many uh, viewers you had on, uh, how many people following you on social media. So it's fair to say you're kind of a medical global rock star, I, I would describe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Some people have said that. It's always a little bit humbling and maybe even a little bit embarrassing when people say that. But, uh, but I've, I've been doing this 20 years and I have put 40,000 hours of research into uh, researching the problems associated with vaccines. And, and I've had a really global reach for a long time. But just in the last 60 days, I've been blessed to have, I've done 105 interviews in 60 days. Wow. And you know what that's like. It takes a ton of energy and some of them are two, three and four hours long. And right. so, um, and, and because of that, it's like, I'm getting to different platforms like yours and like right. with Brian Rose on London Real that, you know, you're reaching out to people that really don't know this topic. And for the first right. time they're getting their eyes awakened and really finding out really what's going on with this topic. You know? Well, it's so important because if you, what I'm interested in the Solera Report, if you come in, our tagline is live a free and inspired life. And the way I came to looking at what was happening in health and medicine was trying to help families be financially solid, financially secure and protect their assets. And what I discovered is it was medicine, health, and what I call the general, you know, the great poisoning, a lot of which was are referred to as vaccines. I no longer call them vaccines now because I don't, I don't think they're medicine. <laughs> anyway, but, but, but I came to it because I was just interested in helping these families be successful. And what I kept coming back to again and again was this was the number one thing destroying their finances. In fact, they could completely ignore what was in their brokerage account. If they just paid attention to everything they were doing in the health and wellness area, they would be more financially successful. Wow. So, yeah. So, um, and one of the reasons I so liked your work is you're very focused as a doctor on helping individuals and families be healthy. And so there's a lot of resonation between what we're doing and what you're doing. So anyway, it's a pleasure. So one of the things that happened to me in the process, I just wrote an article called The Injection Fraud, and in the process of writing it, I found out about the PERP Act. And I, I believe that absolutely the way to stop all this crazy poisoning is to take away the freedom from liability from the industry, the companies, the regulators. You know, you've got a whole world of people who are making a fortune because they found a way to get rid of liability. Now, part of that is the 86 Vaccine Compensation Act, but part of it is the PERP Act. And I said to you before, oh, it's just like the Bushies to come up with something like that. So you are a real expert and started to bring this to everybody's attention. Could you tell us about the PERP Act? Yeah, and, and I'm glad you've prefaced that by talking about the 1986 Vaccine Injury Compensation Act, because that's kind of where it started, that they passed a complete liability protection that you couldn't sue the manufacturers, you couldn't sue for the individual ingredients, you couldn't sue for any type of uh, injury, and they created this false thing called the Federal, the federal Court of Claims. Uh, through the Federal Court of Claims, they, they refer to as the Vaccine Court court, right. which is just a sham court that's just a nonsense. But that in the 1986 acts that was specifically designed to just cover the vaccines that are on the childhood vaccination schedule. And right. that's the reason why when they opened that door in 1986 and gave them that liability protection, it was just like opening a checkbook <laughs> for them to make more and more vaccines, it, right. it, it's, which started the ramp up in 1991 when they added hepatitis B at birth. And, and that's why every single vaccine that they have made since then goes into the pediatric schedule because that's where their liability protection is. It has nothing to do with health of children. It doesn't even have anything to do with whether or not those children are going to catch those or contract those infections. The products that they make, they, that's where they get the liability protection. I want to stop you right there because we're, this is integrative. We're integrative. We're integrating finance and politics. It was at the same exact time that they created the asset, asset or forfeiture fund at the Department of Justice. 
and set up the relationship in the bureaucracy so the bureaucracy could make money, literally, you know, the division could get money through the appropriations process by seizing other people's assets, but people could get bigger bonuses. So the individuals, you know, and I also think there's an illegal kickback system going on, but for another day. Anyway, but they set up a model where the regulators could make money by participating in the process. And when they created that 86 freedom from liability, they also had a process in place where, in essence, the regulators could make money from the vaccine patents. Is that not true? I didn't know about the time frame of that, but I did know about the vaccine patents. And I know that the, the US government has patented many pathogens, like right. mycoplasma and human papillomavirus, and they patent all of those, which is illegal. They're not allowed to, do, to patent something that's living in nature. And then they, right. li they license those patents back to the drug companies in order for them to make drugs and vaccines and biologics from. So, and then when they do that, then the US government, so they, they, they patent the, the virus, they license it back to, uh, say, Merck to make the, the Gardasil right. vaccine. And then we pay an enormous amount of money to buy the Gardasil vaccine because the U.S. government is the largest purveyor of vaccines of any individual purchaser in the world. And we've guaranteed the drug companies that if somebody out there doesn't want to buy their filthy, dirty products, no problem. We'll buy them back from you. Right. So now we've created a financial juggernaut with profound conflicts of interest. Yep where they make a fortune from increasing the vaccines and the vaccine mandates, but then it goes into turbo drive in 2005. So then take us into the PERP Act. Well, right before that, there was the, the, the Project BioShield came into play in 2003, and that's important because that came off the backside of 9-11, you know, after 9-11, after right. that they thought that this was a big terrorist act. And remember, in, after 9-11, they wanted to go around and start revaccinating everyone with the smallpox vaccine. We had that little nonsensical anthrax scare that was just false flag all over it, you know, and so they did that. And so out of that, Bush too, you know, you were talking about being very bushy. <laughs> You know, Bush too created Project BioShield in 2003, and that started with $5.6 billion of funding, ostensibly, and that was supposed to stay in place over 10 years. Right. And what that did was it guaranteed the purchases of these countermeasures in, that they produced. And it also created for the first time this whole concept of the EUA, the Emergency Utilization Authority, came out of Project BioShield. Is that again, was, Emergency Utilization, utilization. Authority. Authority. An okay. EUA. That's why right. all they, they do all of these things now that's like, oh, this is an emergency because they can implement that right. from the 2003 Project BioShield Act. And what it did was it, it gave them all the money they needed, it gave them emergency utilization, and it guaranteed government purchase of their products if they couldn't sell them internationally. But they weren't happy with that. That wasn't good enough, even though they could, they could belly up to the bar and suck in all the money that they wanted. It's like, well, wait a minute, where's our liability protection from that? So between 2003 and 2005, there were 13 or 14 different pieces of legislation in Congress that were floated up to the top to give them liability protection, and they never got any traction. There was one piece of legislation that finally you know, came clean and the activists find, started finding out about that what do you mean? You mean they're going to fast track this? They're going to get an emergency utilization authority, which means that you don't have to do animal testing. And when the product gets, and this is the language, gets safe enough, then you can right. release it onto the public. Not safe, <laughs> safe enough. enough. It, as defined by whom? Who defines safe enough, right? Right. So they, it wasn't really working. And so finally, they snuck this piece of legislation in, which the PREP Act, it stands for Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, which is a tongue twister mouthful. So it's Public Readiness right. Emergency Preparedness Act, which is the PREP Act. And how that got, uh, got put into place was that at the time, Senator Fritz from, from uh, Tennessee and, and Hatcher um, at 1130, on a Saturday night, on December the 17th, after everybody had already signed off on the 2006 defense appropriation bill, which is like right. $430 million, they walked over from the Senate side, they went into the House side, and they insisted that this piece of legislation that was initially called Division E was, tack was, was tacked onto the back side of that defense appropriation bill. 
Nobody in Congress had read it. Very right. few people in the Senate had read it, but that became the law of the land. And what that did was it gave the pharmaceutical companies, whenever there is a public um, emergency that's declared or a public health emergency, like a pandemic, you know, that's declared, right. it gave them liability of all drugs, biologics, vaccines, software, technologies, anything that they could define as a countermeasure right. against this emergency um, against this um, pandemic or whatever public health emergency that they declared, they get complete, complete liability protection. And, and who, get, who pays for that? So if somebody's victimized by it, here's you know, the next if, piece of if it. it's defined as a vaccine, they can go into the compensation court. Where do they go if it's a drug? They don't. There's the, none. There's n under the PREP Act, there is no compensation. Okay. They say, they, in fact, in order for you to move forward with any sort of lawsuit against the government or the drug makers or the manufacturers or the software makers, the people making the micro -sick chip technologies, all of that stuff, right. you would have to take this information and take it to the U.S. Attorney General and convince the U.S. Attorney General that they created this product under an act of willful misconduct. Right which is impossible to prove because now you've got to figure out how they were thinking. And unless you can convince the AG that they did this with, under an act of willful misconduct, there is no moving forward to any sort of compensation. Right. Unlike the 1986 act that has the, that has, the, has the injury compensation program for which they paid out over $4 billion to injured parties and they think that's only 10% of people have been injured. There is a funds bucket that's supposedly set up underneath the PREP Act has zero dollars in it. And in order for that to get funded, Congress has to go back and fund it, and they have to make a list of, of types of injuries they're willing to pay for. Which is so, traditionally nothing. Which is nothing. Right. So, so I want to point out one thing. I don't know how the definition of emergency under the PERP Act compares to emergency under the federal mortgage and federal insurance and the financial accounts. But traditionally, when you created, uh, when you announced a federal disaster or a federal emergency, you suddenly had very broad powers to take money and spend it in very non-accountable ways. And progressively in cycles, this has become basically, you know, a license to have another bank robbery. It's so exactly it, what it is. Right. At the same time that the medical cartel is doing its bank robbery, then you know, it's very easy to make deals for all the others and the financial institutions to have bank robberies. So the profitability of an emergency is, is very strong in a much broader constituency who would want the medical cartel to help them have an emergency. That's exactly it. You nailed it. Right. That is right. exactly it because this is absolutely um, it, it. So even if people are harmed or knowingly harmed, you have got to pr you've got to prove willful misconduct in order it's for possible. enforcement management to go for it, which is impossible. Right. It's impossible. And, and, and then the other thing that makes this so nefarious is that the 1986 Act was just the childhood vaccinations. I've been right. saying for the last five years, adults, they're coming after you next. And that's right. exactly what this is. And so this, this piece of legislation that was passed in 2005, there's only a handful of legislators up on the Hill that have longevity and they wouldn't even know about it. It was buried. And I only know about it because I happened to be writing a book about the bird flu in real time when this was actually happening. And who would know about it? In fact, I've heard some like commentators, like I've heard like Hugh Hewitt and various people talking about well, what, what do you mean that we should pass some legislation to protect them? They know nothing about this, nothing. And right. I love Hugh Hewitt. I listen to him every morning and uh -huh. I just want to, I just want to take a shoe and throw it at the, at the radio <laughs> sometimes in the morning. Cause I, and I want to be able to get to him and say, listen, you know, not what you're talking about right. and you're given wrong information, but this whole thing now it's, it protects them against adult liability. And Alex Azar, you know, the secretary of HHS, Right. activated the PREP Act February 3rd of this year and documented it into the Federal Register on March the 17th. So that means in, now that it's in the Federal Register, it will stay active until which time the Secretary of HHS, either the current one or some future one, says that we are no longer under a pandemic situation with COVID-19. And the oh, way that they're, the way they're setting this up, it's forever. Well, let me, let me talk money now. If you're rolling out 5G and you're worried that it's gonna cause a lot of disease and harm, 
the, the way to protect yourself against liability is to declare a virus, say it's a second wave, and then exercise the PERP Act and the 86 Act, and you're completely covered. You've completely covered all liability on 5G. Exactly. Right? And, 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 and remember, it's also a technology, which with the 5G would be. It mm -hmm. would be a frequency. It would be a piece of software. You know, there's, a, there's companies out there with this tracking software stuff. Right. So it's that all of that is protected from liability, even if it breaks every sort of HIPAA violation, every sort of personal right, uh, uh, you know, uh, privacy thing that you can do, doesn't really matter. I mean, there's a company called Covipass. Are you familiar with no. C-O-V-I-P-A-S-S? -S, I've believe seen it, but I don't know them. Oh. It, they're in an internet. This has been brewing for a while, Catherine. I mean, this for this to be this big of a company internationally with all with locations in all the primary cities like Dubai and Hong Kong and and Toronto and New York and all these different places. It's a down. It's part of the downloadable app that tracks all of your vaccination records, tests all of your testing, which the testing is nonsensical. I hope we can talk right. about that a little bit. Oh, absolutely. And we, and we talk about, and then the, uh, you know, it, then, oh, by the way, we can just put all your financial information in there too, and you'll never lose it. And what if you want to lose the phone? Well, why don't we just like chip it into you? Then you never have to worry about losing any of these things again. Right, right, right. And then if you got lost, your kids could find you. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, you know, the, I would say one of the positive things about what's happening is for many years when I tried to warn people where this was going, they couldn't fathom it was this bad, and at least I know. this way they're coming out of the closet. So, uh, I bought, I purchased the URL www.coalition against mandatory vaccination in 2002. I bought that in 2002. I knew that it was going to come to this. And right. I tried to get every activist person that I knew on board with it. I said, we need to just accumulate numbers right now. And I thought it would be something that even pro-vaccine people at that point in time could get behind. You know, yeah, we want our vaccines, but we don't think anybody should mandatorily have to have it. I couldn't get a single person involved with it because they were like, it'll never get that bad, Sherry, ever. You're just such a reactionary. It'll, <laughs> it'll never get to that point, you know? Right. Yeah, seriously. Right. right. Yeah. And here we are, you know. So let me mention one thing, um, and I think it very much relates as an economic matter to the PERP Act. Um, my concern, I, last night on Money and Markets, I did something for the theme. I did something called the stoppables. These are the things we have to stop. And um, one was the man, you know, was the injection mandates. But another was the defund the police. Um, you know, the Bushies were always great at sneaking around. And they reflect a certain kind of person who uses the federal laws and regulations, bureaucracies to engineer control. And, and that's why I said the PERP Act was so very much, and I'm not saying it came out of the bushes it, once you described the way it went, but obviously they signed it into law. Anyway, um, for about, once they signed the asset forfeiture fund, once, once they created the asset forfeiture fund, they built an infrastructure that networked into the state and local enforcement lines and the local police and allowed them to build really train tracks on top of the war on drugs regulations and control that really built up a control grid. And one of the things they did was they took a lot of the defense contractors who were building the control grid in the federal government and they had them get lots of contracts with the social services departments. And you would come in, there was one contractor who was famous for litigating several places where they were guilty of sex slave trafficking oh. um, in foreign contracts. And they had a very, tip, you know, they had a reputation that was compatible with that. Anyway, so, so I had had a couple of run-ins to them. They started to get social service contracts where they were doing support for child services. And given their track record, it was very frightening. Well, I'm watching the other day when they're, you know, the, you have this push to defund the police and what they're talking about is moving that money, cutting the police budgets and moving it money over to social services. And I don't think what most people realize is I'm betting that there's a whole infrastructure of defense and corporate, you know, sort of federal contractors ready to grab that money and jump up with contact tracing to be a real Stasi grid. The speed at which they could bring up a control grid in, in, you know, through those mechanisms is frightening. Very frightening. 
very, right. very frightening. And, and when you talk about into social services, I mean, the whole concept of, you know, ch child protective services, I mean, right. it's always amazing to me how they come up with these names that are just the antithesis of what they really are. You know, you know when to, I worked, you know, I used to work in Washington and we had a rule. If you wanted to understand what a, a proposed piece of legislation was about, you would invert the name. So it was making neighborhoods wonderful. It's taking control and raping places, you know. <laughs> And so you know, we would automatically invert the name to, to figure out what it was really about. Yeah, wow. I've always thought, that, I always suspected that that was true because it seems so obvious, but to hear it, you know, straight out, that's, that's pretty amazing. Right. Uh, it was the way it was. Well, if you, if you take the economics, if they have a, you know, the social services defense contractor grid ready to come up fast, and you have the money that you're describing you know, through these various mechanisms ready to pour out and there's no liability. I mean, what we're describing is a way of instituting a complete control grid down to controlling our bodies and all of our assets that's phenomenally profitable. Yes, and the fact that, you know, Bill Gates has, has already said, you, you know, and it, it, it's just such a crapshoot in terms of developing these <laughs> vaccines. I mean, we know that there were at least 140 companies that came like racing to the, to the money trough to get started right. into this. Right. And then they've narrowed it down to 16 potential candidates. And then now they're looking at maybe nine. And, and, and Gates is like setting up these factories and stuff already. And I heard in an interview, somebody said the other day in an interview, they said, so it just sounds like it's just like going to the, the craps table in Las Vegas and, and taking, you know, the names of these vaccines and just rolling them across the table and seeing which ones win pretty much. Oh, but in, yeah. In venture capital in it, you know, when I was on wall street in a venture capital fund, we do 30 investments knowing say that 27 fail would fail two would come out okay and one would be such a blockbuster that the whole fund would make money so so financing a whole series of things some of which aren't going to work or are going to fail if you want to go fast is a very good economics and that's what gates is doing and and he's in, and now he's already said we've got to you know first he was talking about we have to really ramp up so that we can create 7.7 .7 billion doses really fast. Oh, wait a minute. We really need double that because what we do with every vaccine trial is two vaccines. We give them the first one, the second one. So we're talking like a multi-trillion dollar deal off of this. Right, no, but it gets better because the profit you're going to make on the injections is nothing. Is nothing. Is nothing. It's the so, follow up. So watch this. No, there's a wonderful book um, by a venture capitalist from China called AI Superpowers. And he has a great description of how AI applies to the creation of financial equity and how it's working in venture. But one of the things he points out, and he does a great description of it, is the person who has the best AI is the person who has the most data. In other mm -hmm. words, the data and the pattern recognition teaches the AI to be smart. Exactly. Okay. So in the gold rush that's occurring, you know, in the theory that data is the new oil, in the gold rush, the winner of the gold rush is the guy who has the most data. Now, if you digitize all life, if you digitize the biosphere, if you digitize the atmosphere, if you digitize all the human beings, you know, if you get access to their minds and their bodies, you have the most, if you digitize all of life, you get the most data, you're the winner. And that's what all this testing is all about. It's data right. harvest, it's DNA harvesting. And I, right. I've said this on several interviews. I've said, you know, it's, it's Bill Gates's wet dream, like come to life. <laughs> you know, it's like DNA harvesting and they're like testing, 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 testing. What are we testing? And as right. we, as a, as a consumer, do we want to be positive? Do we want to be positive, which means that you've so, had the virus? So the, or do you want, or do you want to, or, do you, or not? Because I, I spent seven hours on the FDA website trying to figure it out because the FDA website is actually much better than the CDC website when they're talking about this testing problem. Right, right. And everybody says, we don't know. We just, just go get tested. What does it mean to be positive? And now that they've come out with the fact that if you're, if you actually have the, if they do it in real time PCR, which is not the technology that they're using. They're using reverse transcriptase PCR, which is really faulty. It has up to a 20% false negative rate. That's the one they're using. But if you use the correct one and you find out that you're positive, 
but we already know that a positive person is not an, asy is an asymptomatic carrier, somebody who's right. healthy, and they're not spewing viruses everywhere, which takes away their whole masking and social distancing and all this other stuff that they're doing. It's, this is purely, in my opinion, purely about data collection, to your point, and it's DNA harvesting on a global scale. Is so here, here's, why do they put the swab all the way so far back into your head, into your nasal cavity? Um, well, because I think that it, because the vi I think that they're assuming that the virus mostly is back here in the back part of your throat, and if you're just doing like nasal swabbing here, you're going to get have a have a a lower possibility of detecting that virus because there'll be a lot more viruses and bacteria in the front part of here. So if they go all the way back, they're more likely to grab that. Really, um, I think that that's what they're doing in terms of this of the swab testing. It's like all the way back, clear back to just above your palate in the back is where so I was watching the movie contagion and in the movie contagion which is you know clearly very slick propaganda for all of this stuff they're sticking the vaccine in your nose now i you know i haven't had a vaccine since i was a tiny child but my recollection was that you got them in the arm you didn't get them in the nose no they have the one for a long time they've taken it on and off the market several times called flu mist uh -huh. And that was a nasal injection up the nose because they thought the, the premise was, well, how do we actually contract influenza as an infection? It's a respiratory infection, right? Right. So you brazily breeze it in. So if we could put those attenuated viruses up the nose and develop an antibody that way, it would probably be better because that's a more natural way of kind of putting the vaccine in. It never worked. Right. And I was always, and I was, I, I tried to track this for a while, Catherine, I couldn't quite do it because you think about the olfactory nerves inside of your nose uh -huh. and we know that viruses can attach to those olfactory nerves and go directly into the brain. So I was thinking as we were squirting 2 billion vaccines, uh, viruses into your nose in the presence of MSG, which was right. one of the ingredients in that and people who are MSG sensitive, what's their primary symptom? It's a headache. So we're squirting MSG up there. It, it never worked. And then that was a live virus. And they said that you needed to be um, not be nursing or not be going to like Walmart or any of those places. Because if you sneezed, you'd be spewing live viruses everywhere. And so for three weeks, you had to stay away for three weeks. And so they've had that one. I think that came out in about 2005-ish. And they have had that on and off the market several different times. So the technology exists to be able to do that. So my concern watching it was if they're trying to get brain machine interface into us, are they, do they want to train us to think of tests and vaccines as going up the head? I believe that's probably true. I think there's right. probably a lot to that, um, you know, because they talk about throat and nasal swabs. Now, for some reason, you know, when you go and you say you have strep throat and they do a, a throat swab, I don't know why they're not doing it that way if they're trying to get a throat swab right. as opposed to uh, going above your throat. Well, into if, that you, if you thing. want DNA, which is better? Probably through, I didn't even think about that, but right. probably through the nose because you're gonna get less contamination back there in the back part of your, of your nasal pharynx than you would in through your mouth. And people, when you go in through the mouth has a higher gag reflex, this way doesn't have as much of a gag reflex. So that's, okay. a, that's a really good point. I think you might be onto something there. I believe there is a pattern of systematic targeting. And I also believe if you're going to try and start, you know, if you're going to insist there's a second wave and people are dying in this place, I don't put it past, you know, I was poisoned many times during the litigation. So I don't put it past anybody in this system to poison people. Now, I was curious if you had heard of any reports of there being danger, real danger of being literally chemically poisoned by one of the tests. Well, you know, when they first started pushing, really pushing hard for all this testing, there were, that I'm aware of, at least three individual reports. Uh, one out of, I believe, Czechoslovakia, there may, the second one was out of Italy, and the third one was directly from the CDC, that the test kits were contaminated with the real virus, and the name of the virus, you know, is SARS-CoV-2. That's the name right. of the virus, and COVID-19 is the condition that it causes. Right. And so, oh, and, and there was a big uproar that went on for a while. It's a very short news cycle. I mean, things are, w are moving so right. fast. I mean, people ask me, how am I doing? I said, well, let's see what part of the matrix I woke up in today. <laughs> it's like sort of different. But there was a lot of uproar about that, meaning what did that mean? 
Did it mean that you could contaminate someone with that virus when you stuck it up their nose? Or did it mean that the sample was automatically going to be positive, whether that person was sick right. or not? And right. just to kind of drive up the numbers. So could there be, could that be that perhaps that person got contaminated with a contaminated swab? Quite possibly. I haven't heard any direct reports like that, but it would not, I, it, this is so nefarious what's going on right, right. now at the high, at, at an accelerated well, level of nefariousness. Right. If you, I, if you look at the, what happened in the nursing homes, both in Seattle and New York. Oh yeah. Unbelievable. Right. I don't know if you've had a chance to watch the, the video of the nurse who was from Florida who worked at Elmhurst. I what did, did you think of that? Do you think she was, the, was she, she was the one that's in the hospital saying that they were literally killing people? Is that the one you're right. talking about? Right. Um, having been, you know, my first career was as an emergency room physician and I was the director of a level two trauma center for 12 years and mm -hmm. knowing that life intimately, um, it doesn't surprise me. It really right. doesn't surprise me, and particularly the younger physicians who seem to be so indoctrinated. I mean, and just absolutely goosed up to the pharmaceutical industry. They don't look left, right. They don't teach kids how to think anymore coming out of medical right. school at right. all. It's algorithm driven medicine. If right. this, then that, and the that is a drug or a test. And some of it, you know, we were trying to figure out what the pathology, the, the pathophysiology of this virus was in real time. You know, people are coming in short of breath and chest pain. And so you know, we're treating them like it's a lung disease. And now we found, and I said early, early on, this is a blood disease. Somehow right. this virus disconnects the iron from the heme. And when you don't have iron and heme hooked together, you cannot carry oxygen through the system. Right. So, and, and because it was disconnecting it without causing a hemolytic anemia, which is breaking down your red blood cells, doctors were missing it. They were picking that up. Right. And all they were seeing was the low oxygenation levels and treating them with ventilators. And that's why people were dying was right. because they didn't have a lung disease. They were damaging their lungs. Right. I can't really blame the physicians for that particular piece except for the fact there was a little economic incentive to put those people on ventilators. Well, the, you know? I, I think I can, I can certainly see it going wrong just because well-meaning people don't know. But then as you looked at, we, we were getting so much intelligence from all over the world about what was working and then they didn't change. And right. It, so it wasn't that it went that way in the beginning, but when it, it was, the ventilators clearly were not working. You had, you know, if you put somebody on a ventilator, it was a death warrant. So but Eight out of, four out of five people died, and it's because, you know, they tried to blow it off and blow up the story. It's like, oh, it's because the sickest of the sick people are being put on ventilators. Well, that really wasn't true. They were putting people on ventilators because and, and mismanaging them because this was not a lung disease, number one. And, and number two, every person they put on a ventilator, they got an extra $39,000 in their pocket. Right, right. And so there was an economic incentive to do that. But there was that one doc, the one video of the one physician there that was saying, wait, we're doing something wrong here. These people are, this should, this should not be what's happening when you put right. people on them. He got fired from his job for trying to right. say that this, we were medically mismanaging these people. Right. And so this, this is the other part, you know, being a physician and being in the practice of medicine since 1985. I mean, I've been around the block for a while and to see how this whole hydrochloroquine thing shook out. And seeing how, you know, there was a couple of case reports of people, if they gave them a couple of packed red blood cell, a couple of units of packed red blood cells when they came in shortness of breath, they didn't need to be put on a ventilator. Once right. again, confirming this is a blood disease about oxygen carrying capacity. That didn't change. The whole, those studies that happened in China about high dose IV vitamin C, how that was helping, how all the oxygen right. therapies, like this is where, you know, when Trump said, you know, put people, give them like, you know, uh, like cl clean them out, you know, give them a syringe or something. What he was really talking about was UVB light radiation. He was right. talking about IV uh, hydrogen peroxide. He was talking about um, uh, ozone and he was right. talking about hyperbaric because I have personal friends who wrote and did the research and sent that information to the White House saying, these are the oxygen therapies that will clean out this virus. Right. Well, Trump sort of, he's, he's not a physician and he sort of interpreted that as being let's disinfect it and clean it out, which is what the oxygen therapies actually do. But right. then, of course, he got taken to the cleaners for saying that, you know. So there were all good therapies, cheap, inexpensive. Right. Things that really they don't want to cure people, Catherine. They don't want to cure them. Well, what's interesting is I think Trump does. And that's why he does oh, these things. Yes, not Even him, though he's them. Right. He, he's going to get whacked. Here's what I learned dealing with financial fraud. Um, you come into a system and something's not working right. 
Now, if the system is sincere, it learns and it adjusts and it heads in the right direction. If it's not working right and every effort to move it in the healthy, successful direction is whacked back, it never learns. And that's how you tell what the real goal is. And I think the, the efforts in the United States to whack all the different intelligence about the protocols that were working was um, you know, perfect proof that wherever this was going, it had nothing to do with you know, getting people, you know, it, a, a real virus and the goal was to get people well. That, that was not the system. And when, I, when this very first started, I mean, within the first couple of weeks, my, here's my, my thought, and you know, the great retrospectoscope, right? You can see, mm -hmm. you see backwards is we did the right thing in the first three weeks because we didn't really know if this really was the killer virus that was gonna kill, wipe out half of humanity. We didn't know if it was ricin, we didn't know if it was some other chemical biological warfare that was going on. So put everybody on big red alert the first three weeks. That makes sense. After that, once we said, no, that's not what this is, then I started saying to people, this has nothing to do with the virus, this is economic warfare at some level. Right. It's all about the money right. at various different levels. And then as it went on, it was not only about the money, it was about power, control, and manipulation. You know, the mask, the social distancing, the, the tracking, the, all this stuff. It's like, this has nothing to do with this pathogen. It, it, these funny things, like they never tested any of this stuff. And we know unequivocally that masks only harm the people that are wearing them. It has right. nothing to prevent a spread of anything. And right. I had this funny thought about, you know, you sneeze and you send out viruses and it goes exactly to six feet and drops to the floor. It's not six foot one or six foot five, you know, so the social distancing is just the destruction of humanness, right? The destruction of humanness. Well, here, here's the way I look at it. Cause to me, this is a currency war. Yes. This is a currency, this is an economic war. It's all about and, and think of it this way, you're trying to get the old to extend because the old was coming down too fast and you didn't have the new in place. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, and, and what you've got is the Anglo-American Alliance is trying to preserve its control of the global financial system. So you've got to keep the dollar going. And this has done a remarkable job of backing up the Chinese and keeping the dollar going. And if you look at how the treasury markets and the different markets performed, you know, it's, it's like a steroid. It's a short-term fix. And mm. it's working as a short-term fix. But you've got to get the new system in place. And one of the things you've, you've got to do, the Chinese aren't going to take, you know, five more trillion dollars to float our false prosperity. So the question is, how are you going to deal with the American people when, the, you, know, when you pull all the air out of the balloon? So the idea is you go from having a, an open currency system to you chip everybody and then you have, you know, you, you basically kill currency at the retail level and you go to a credit system where everybody has a credit, uh, credit on the company store. And, and if they don't behave, you know, this is the mark of the beast. Absolutely. The but it's much more sophisticated and complex than they ever described in the Bible. And, I, you know, the way I make it simple is, you know, Bill Gates put crappy software in all our computers. We had to update it constantly because there was always a new virus to be afraid of. And he gave a back door to the NSA and you know all the folks and their, their business was surveillance capitalism. They just want to take the model and do it to our brains and our bodies. And they're going to hook it up to the Jedi and Amazon cloud at the DOD. That's why DOD is involved in Operation Warp Speed, which we have to talk about. So, Are so you, that, and that's also why, you know, why they called it Windows for a reason, right? <laughs> <laughs> they called exactly, touche. They called, they called, they called right. it Windows for a reason, right? Windows on your world. <laughs> exactly. It's the one-way mirror. It's the one-way mirror, but yeah. it's, you know, uh, yeah. And, it, and so it's not, only, it's not only the mark of the beast, which I totally agree with you. And I've been talk, I talk about this a lot on my interviews. Mm -hmm. It's like, we've been talking about this in future tense someday, someday. It's here. It's now. It's real time. It. We've right. got, you know, the UN 17 sustainability goals. We've got, you know, one world order, one world money, one world religion. You know, how many of interviews are coming out now of, of <laughs> supposed government leaders saying all of us have to collectively work together in one unified system in order to combat this virus, right? I mean, right. how much more, I mean, they're not trying to hide it anymore. No. How much more obvious it's, can it possibly be? And how did people adopt to this so quickly? I mean, so I don't that's think, I don't think they have. I, so I, I break it down. You know, it's complex. 
One of the challenges, one of my favorite Solari reports in uh, 2006, I'd had a scientist who taught me about entrainment technology and subliminal programming. Let me back up. I was on Wall Street and I overheard two billionaire types talking about entrainment and subliminal programming and rolling it out on TV and how they're going to control everybody's minds. And it's, it scared me to death. It scared me to death. I went home. I gave away, it was 1984. I gave away my TV and I haven't owned a TV since. And one of the things I discovered when I was litigating and sort of talking very publicly, I traveled around the world one year and gave a speech. And every time I gave, I gave a speech in Sweden, London, uh, New Zealand, all across the United States, every time I gave a speech, I said, who here owns a television? And everywhere, less than 10% of the people who raised their hands owned a television. What I discovered is, oh, my audience are people who don't have televisions. But you know, so, so it started then. So my impression was it, it started, you know, through the TVs heavily in the 80s. But then it's become much more sophisticated. And when I was an investment advisor for families and individuals for 10 years, and I kept running into people who were being defrauded using entrainment technology. And they would literally be hustled over the internet, over phone, over radio. A lot of it was coming through the smartphones and the computers. And they would be encouraged to do financially insane things. You know, things where I would say as an investment advisor, you have a 100% chance of losing all this money if you do this. You know, it was totally fraud, but it was very, very cleverly done and combined with other things. So, for example, I believe one of the ways there's 21 trillion missing from the federal government. I believe one of the ways they were able to engineer that is by getting so many bureaucrats hooked on pornography online using entrainment technology but then they switch in the young actresses and actors and, and they've got them on child porn. So you've got control files on a fantastic number of people, at which point, you know, pretty economically, they have to do what you say. Anyway, so, so I asked this guy, please, we do a Solari report because my, you know, I'm having trouble explaining to my clients that this stuff exists. They don't realize, you know, you can't defend yourself against something you don't even know exists. It's invisible. So, um, so he did a Solari report in 2010 on entrainment technology and financial fraud. Now, if you, I always get my subscribers in combination with that to watch all the movies that show entrainment technology. So the Kingsman or the Cell, they're pretty gruesome movies, but they do show the technology. And I, if you look at what's happening with a lot of the young people, you know, you're talking about all sorts of propaganda and peer pressure being combined with entrainment and subliminal programming. I mean, this is mind control. And totally. Um, right. And, uh, you know, so we're dealing with, and it's very tragic because it's destroying families. I've had parents write me and say, you know, my kids have been taken over by a cult. They've lost their minds. They're just not behaving like rational people. And it's very frightening. It's very sure. frightening. I mean, and when you look at like what's happening this week in Seattle, I mean, you know, those, those people are 20 and 30 somethings, you know, with Antifa taking over those neighborhoods and setting up barriers and all of that stuff. And, you know, it's, um, we've had right, some- Right, but I, I think a lot of those folks are trained and paid. Oh, of course they are. Right. In right. fact, we, we had, um, oh, yes, I could, t I could tell you lots of stories about how they're trained and paid and, and they're paid primarily with, um, with gift cards or with Monero, which is an absolutely right. untraceable Bitcoin, right? Right. And so they can, so when, you know, the, they get paid with gift cards, which those are not, not traceable either. So they right. can get a Walmart gift card, card or a grocery card gift card or something like that. So it's just money that slushes through the system that's not, not traceable. Right. You know, so they've, so they're, they're, uh, we've caught how many now paid actors, you know, oh, this one was in that and that and that and that. Oh, really? And, um, but it's interesting that you said to me that you don't think that most people have, have bought into it. I, I hope you look, you're right. If you look at the polls on defunding the police, 84% of Americans have no interest whatsoever in defunding the police. And I think a lot of, um, just if I could take the feedback from my networks, a lot of people uh, don't want to raise their hand, don't want to talk about it because what they're watching is so bizarre, they don't feel like they understand. So if you don't know how you're going to attack something because you don't really understand it, you know, you tend to freeze in place while you're figuring out what's going on. But 
what I see is, you know, the people who haven't gotten the chip yet, and, you know, to a certain extent, I think with the spring and other things, we've all gotten some of the, you know, some of this crap in us. But I, I see a lot of people who understand how dangerous this is, because what we're talking about is the end of sovereignty. Totally. So right. it actually, actually, I think it's beyond that. I think we're talking about the end of humanity, humanity as we know it, you know, because of the social distancing and these masks and these wearing these, making these kids wear masks at schools that they don't learn facial recognition and, right. and how to, uh, you know, I, and the social distancing, you know, people now look at you like you're, you're something wrong with you or that you're <laughs> typhoid Mary or something if you don't have on a mask. And so you're standing apart. We want to do away with handshaking, any sort of human touching, which is part of humanness. I think of right. humans as like a, like a bunch of puppies in a basket, right? They want to tumble over top of each other and play and, and laugh laugh and giggle and all this other stuff. Now we're not allowing to do that because, you know, your kids might be unvaccinated. And so I don't want my vaccinated kids playing with your unvaccinated kids. Right. And now we're talking about social distancing so that, you know, there's something wrong with you. And if you don't want to take that test or take that vaccine, well then shame on you. Shame, 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 the social shaming stuff. I think it's beyond sovereignty. I think it's the destruction of humanity as we know it. So, so, I have a theory on this because I think that we share intelligence and all the activities you're describing are part of our sharing intelligence. Yep. And if you want to get humans resonating with the machine instead of with each other and all life, which is necessary to control, right. what you're trying to do is you're trying to set up the physical, emotional, cultural conditions to, con to, to, so that you can control them centrally with AI and software. So they don't resonate with the divine. They don't resonate with life. They resonate with your machine. Yeah, That's they don't resonate with each other. You know, and I, now that you've got all this handheld thing, you know, with your phone that everybody's, they might as well just suture it into the palm of your hand <laughs> because people never let go of it, right? And, and they've trained us to be that way. They've trained right. us to do that. Well, but we've, you know, I, I kind of feel like we've gone along. Yeah, and, exactly. And we don't have to go along. So... I do want to mention Operation Safe uh, uh, Warp Speed, but then I want to talk about why I'm an optimist, because I am an optimist. And since you know the Bible, then it's, this is going to be easy to do. So I just <laughs> want to bring up Operation uh, Warp Speed, because you and a group of people were doing a fantastic, I mean, unbelievably fantastic job, and proof facts matter, science matters of destroying Fauci's credibility and then Bill Gates's credibility. And I'm watching you all just rip him to shreds and I'm going like, this is so much fun. And then here comes Trump with Operation Warp Speed because they figured out Fauci and Gates were, you know, we're not going to be able to do the sell here. So they get this guy from GlaxoSmithKline. So I thought, okay, I'm going to learn about this. I get on the internet. I'm a, I'm a Financial Times subscriber. In 2012, he's on the Financial Times being heralded as the leader in bioelectronics and brain-machine interface. Wow. Right. There's a great article. I'll send you a copy of it from, from uh, Financial Times laying out his whole vision of brain-machine interface and bioelectronics. It's and, incredible. And, and, and at his right hand in this project is a four-star general. Right. Right. And now we have the, the, the depart. Well, remember, I think the goal is to hook 7 billion people up to the Jedi cloud. Do you know what the Jedi cloud is? It's a $10 billion cloud contract. Uh, several years ago, the CIA put out an enormous cloud contract to Amazon. It's called the Amazon cloud. And then DOD has been working to get the Jedi contract out, which is a $10 billion cloud contract at uh, DOD, they were expecting Amazon to win it. Microsoft, Bill Gates won it. I think that's one of the reasons he resigned from the board to protect that connection anyway. So, so and, and there's big wrestling now going on in the courts between Amazon and, and Microsoft as to whether Microsoft's gonna keep it or they're gonna get to split it. But either way, you're gonna have these two Amazon, Microsoft, huge cloud contracts at the intelligence agencies and the military, the goal is to kind of integrate everything into these databases. And I have news for you. Once you have those contracts working in place, you can re-engineer the entire federal government at high speed through the cloud. Boom, boom, boom. Because it's all cash flows, right? You can just re-engineer everything. Um, it's quite remarkable what can be done. But if you can get everybody chipped and hooked up to that cloud, you know, then you've got the basis of a 
of a, a high speed reengineering of the whole culture and civilization that will blow your mind. And when I said bring in the new system, that is absolutely how the Anglo American Alliance can stay the dominant financial power globally. If they've got everybody chipped and coming into the to the Microsoft and Amazon clouds, there you go. Wow. Right. So I when I took a look at operation. And that's why the mandates are so important to, to, to stop. stop. And that's why I think it's really important that as a political matter, we stop calling these vaccines. Because, you know, manipulating your genes without consent is not a medicine. Is that, would that be fair to say? That's really a great, great way to state it, actually. Right. Injecting nanotechnology or brain machine interface into you or or quantum dotting it onto your skin that's not medicine and i've been calling saying for a long time i keep calling vaccines foreign matter they're injecting foreign matter into you that to develop a, an antibody that is nothing more than a marker of contamination right. the antibody does nothing to protect you to keep you from getting sick vaccines do not prevent infection but they do cause disease and the disease is something that comes and stays for a lifetime. Right. And infection is something that comes and goes. So I've worked the last couple of years. There's a few words I've, I've worked really hard to get out of our lexicon. One is immunize and immunization. Mm -hmm. I needed to get that out because that's not what we do. I needed to get the, get the word um, disease. Stop calling measles a disease. It's an infection. And most of right. us have had a sinus infection or a, a, a you know, bladder infection or something like that. It comes and goes. It's not a disease. A disease is something that comes like, like uh, asthma, allergies, eczema, insulin-dependent diabetes, lupus, autoimmune conditions, and vaccines cause all of those. Right. And so we need to, uh, so I've been calling it foreign matter. What would you think, what do you think is the best word to be calling this? So I don't know yet because um, I'll tell you how this happened. I was reading Mary Holland's 2012 inter, uh, uh, piece she did for the Yale Journal on yes. the history of, you know, it's basically the case law on vaccine law. And for about a, the last year, I've had this, I'm a very intuitive person. I've had this free floating anxiety. Something is deeply wrong and I'm dealing with a deep state trick and I'm being played and I have, you know, I can't see it. I know there's a duck in the bush, but I'm like, I'm getting played. I'm getting played. Where is it? Where is it? I got to figure this out. So I'm reading Mary's thing. I'm reading it. And then I realize, wait a minute, all this protection for what Gates and Operation Warp Speed, all this protection for the new financial system. You know, and, and what I tell people is injectable credit cards are not vaccines. So why should injectable credit cards or why should bio waste or why should gene alteration have the protection of these laws and the compensation fund because they're not medicine? And that's when I realized that's the trick. That's the trick. They, what they've done is they said, if we can get the protection of medicine under the law and under the victim's compensation fund, we can get away with murder. That's literal murder. They, literal murder. Murder. Literal murder. We can experiment. We can turn them all into guinea pigs. Because part of this, remember, from their goal, this is transhumanism. I want to be able to use robots and cyborgs and human in the same taxation and labor systems. I can save several trillion dollars by getting them integrated into one system. That's a huge money maker for me. And so, um, and so what do I need to do to do that? And a lot of these things are experimentation to figure out how you're going to make that integration work. So, so I looked at this and I said, this is a fraud because they're not, they're not medicine. If you define legally as a vaccine, and I think most people think of vaccine as a, as a medicine, as a medicine, a medical. Yeah, it's a medical procedure. procedure. So it falls, a medical it, procedure. It falls under, you know, it's a procedure because you're injecting something, right? And so right. It, it, it does fall under that. And people have come to falsely believe that vaccines are safe, which they're not. They keep you from getting sick, which they right. don't. They they are complete. They've completely, completely, and thoroughly been tested so that they cause no problems, which is a lie. And they've right. become kind of a, a wrap their head around thinking that a vaccine is as good for you as a shot of B twelve and is as benign for you as a shot of sterile water. So the question is what? Because I think there are two issues here. One is the digital technology, and then the other is the gene manipulation. You know, and there are two distinctly different 
things and we're both at risk from both of them. And I don't know how you would define the nanoparticles if they would fit into those two categories or there's a third category. Well, the nanoparticles, I think, would just be an ingredient because think about like the, all the aluminum and mercury, those are particles. So, and they're already thoroughly entrenched in vaccines. In fact, if a child is fully vaccinated from birth to 18 years of age, they get almost 12,000 micrograms of aluminum injected, you know, which gets picked up by the white blood cells and carried into various places, including across the, red, uh, across the blood brain barrier. And so the, I think the nanotechnology, the nanoparticles, and the things that, um, that Corvelva discovered, you, you, you've, have you read the Corvelva report? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. You know, and all the things that are there, that are there that aren't supposed to be there and things like stainless steel particles and all this other stuff that's, that's inside of these vaccines. And they found, um, you know, um, uh, psychotropic drugs inside of the Gardasil vaccine. And, right. and so, you know, it's, there's no liability. And, and that's what, what we started earlier about talking about the PrEP Act. What I've been trying to tell people is that they can literally, literally put anything in that solution that they want. And anything. Right. So the nanobots, the little bots that they talk about, any sort of AI technology, frequencies, they could put frequencies in there, anything. And they have complete liability protection for this. So all of these people who, who are terrified, scared to death of this coronavirus, and they want to run to the head of the line to get this vaccine, well, you know, I, hope you, I hope you have your financial affairs in order before so, you do that. So normally when you call something something, you're describing both what is, it is and what the intention is. And so, you know, it's funny, Rappaport and I were trying to describe this and we were referring to it as CyberVax because we just didn't have a name for it. But, and that relates more to the digital technology. But I do think we need to come up with a name of what it is and you know that it implies what its intention is but it's not a vaccine and i think that's really really good because you know nature abhors a vacuum and if you're right. trying trying to take something out of somebody's brain you need to put something in so like this whole thing when i have been trying to tell people to quit calling these diseases they're actually infections so i'm taking out the word disease and putting in the word infection right this whole thing about the new normal right. what i'm telling people to do is take out new normal and put in temporary abnormal because <laughs> you know, they have to think about something, right. you know, the, well, if it's not, what is it? So if we got to take out the name vaccine, which I think is brilliant, is a right. brilliant tactic. Right. We need to come up with something to put right. and say, no, 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 it's not a vaccine. That would be a medicine. And maybe that can help you. This, this is X and it's not going to do anything but so harm you. I want you to think about this and I want everybody listening to think about this. You know, we've, we're describing what this, cocktail is uh, it's like a it's like a new world order cocktail <laughs> so we're just great it's a control cocktail but mm -hmm. but we need to come up with a name which works and helps really define what it is and help people understand what it is and then we replace vaccine with with and this. that will help people get to the place of, you know, my part, my business partner and I, when we started Courses for Mastery, which is our educational company, it's mm -hmm. coursesformastery.com. When we started this three and a half years ago, Matt said to me, he said, what's your ultimate goal? And I said, we need to absolutely ensure people's rights to refuse. And right, right. to refuse without ramification was the line that we came up with right to refuse without ramification. I said, because if we can get that shored up for people, then we've got time on the back end for educating them away from, of why they should refuse a vaccine. And if we could use that word in terms of like educating them away from vaccines, because that's not what you're getting, you're getting this. Right. I think that would be a brilliant strategy, brilliant. Right. I don't know if you know this, one of the reasons Daniel Webster, I mean, was it Daniel Webster? Webster made a dictionary was he was concerned that they were going to try and change the constitution and he said they're not going to change the constitution by amending it they're going to change the constitution by changing the meaning of the words ah. and when i was reading mary holland's article i could hear that in my mind and i said you know webster was right and that's exactly what they've done here it's brilliant wow. yeah yeah they're they're you know they I mean, trained it's me of, it's so brilliant the whole concept of like extraterrestrial life, you know, is, is I've often said it, it, it's the only thing that makes sense because humans aren't smart enough to come up with these ideas. 
it has to be so it has to be somebody some extra somebody much more brilliant like eons ahead because normal humans couldn't come up with anything this this integrated and this nefarious they really oh would. i i think once they worked out um once they worked out the microsoft operating system scheme on the computers it was an easy leap you know it was it was a very easy jump especially when you look at the fact they really do want to run everything with ai and software and sort of cut out all the middle management and because if you want to run a very centralized system humans are very complex you know uh you know everybody's different and so, uh, you know, if you want to get everybody in a box and run it on a very centralized basis, then doing the Microsoft operating system in the body and brain makes a lot of sense. Now, here's the interesting thing, though. If you look at their, uh, you know, their science, their study, their laboratories, these guys will think they have something. They have no clue how it's going to work in real life. That's why I say they're going to kill hundreds of millions of people doing this. They definitely are. This, this right. vaccine that's come into market has never been done before. You know, th this is a concern of mine, Catherine, is this vaccine, this RNA vaccine has never been done before. They've been trying to develop a coronavirus vaccine, this RNA vaccine for more than 20 years since the SARS outbreak. They've been trying to do it. When they've tested it on ferrets, all the ferrets died. When they tested it on mice and rats, they all acquired this acceler accelerated autoimmune disease. Right. Science is out there. And so this whole thing, and I, I want to go back to what you're talking about, this Operation Warp Speed, because this whole idea of accelerating this and, and getting a vaccine to market in six months, number one, they get the emergency utilization authorization to bypass the fast pack, the animal studies. Why would they want to waste time on the animal studies? They know what the results are going to be. The animals number two is that, you know, when they bring this to market, it's not about the vaccine. It's about the re-exposure to the virus. So they start ejecting people before this second wave comes along, that's when people are going to die. My concern about the, I, I hope you can enlighten me about this Operation Warp Speed, what's going on behind the scenes, because if, if, if this pushes forward and, and Trump in any ways associated with, he's going to have blood on his hands, because all of these studies are going to come forward saying that all the studies conclude by saying we must be very, very careful when we are developing a coronavirus vaccine for humans because of the results of these animal studies. It's out there. They're all there. It's nothing so, new. So think of this as the equivalent of when India came out with a biometric system and then tried to cancel cash and millions of people were destroyed, small businesses destroyed. You know, it was a declared a huge success. The bankers are really happy because they're getting everybody on the system. The time, you know, Operation Warp Speed is not about Operation Warp Speed to, to dealing with COVID-19 or the SARS COVID-2. It has nothing to do with that. It has to getting the new financial system in place before the dollar and de-dollarization get the dollar in just serious trouble. So if you look at what's happening in the federal finances, they have a very short window to get the new installed. So this has nothing to do with, the with any, it has nothing to do with anything having to do with health or medicine. It has to do with how are they going to get everybody in the company credit system before you know, before the system runs out of control. So they're worried about a global dollar, um, a serious hiccup, implosion, everything else. So they're worried about maintaining central control. And all of this is about maintaining central control. It has nothing to do with medicine or health. The wow. COVID-19 is an op. <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know the details of what happened in Wuhan or why. One of my questions is, was Charles Lieber just doing a brain machine interface prototype that went wrong? That's one of my questions. So, so this, has, this is not about an epidemic or a pandemic. This is about keeping the old financial system going and getting the new one in. And the new one is a company credit system, which is based on the individual one way or another being identifiable in a digital basis. And does that go with like the Chinese social credit system then too? Yes, yes. So they have the Chinese, the Chinese are prototyping one system, you know, but this is a matter of, of getting it implemented broadly globally. And you have to do it, you know, I don't know if you've seen the, the, we, the, the M1, M2 numbers in the last year, M1 is up 20, over 20%, M2 is up over 30%. 
And the only way that doesn't turn into hyperinflation is if you have, if you can force deflation. Now, COVID-19 has, and I saw you talking about this, you clearly realized you're talking about creating massive deflation to offset that hyperinflation by knocking out all the small businesses and, and driving all that uh, income into the fangs. You kill a lot of, you know, that's a lot of deflation to offset the monetary hyperinflation, but you can't keep that going forever. No. So I mean, if people are, people, the deflation, in my opinion, is, um, you know, people are selling off their stuff to pay their bills. Right. There's only so much stuff to sell. Right. You know, when you've, you've gutted your house and you've sold everything, you're done. There's nothing else to right. do. Right. And that's when you want to have a chip in a person. Yeah. So you want to have a chip in them and you want to be able to give them a universal basic income and turn it on and off unless they do what they're told. So why are the priests, why are the pastors not talking about this? Why are the mega churches not saying, look what's happening? You know, your Bible based church and you're, you're talking about, I mean, you said it, I've been saying it. This is real time mark of the beast people. This is it. This is what we've been talking about. What's been predicted for 3000 years. The churches aren't even whispering this. So um, it's, it's complex. Now remember you have a one-way mirror where the NSA and the intelligence agencies are listening to every person in real time using AI and software. So they've got a remarkable control grid. And for the last 20 years, they've been building ways of managing and dealing with people. And one of them is very broadly control files. So there are very few people in America who don't have a control file, including the pastors. That's number one. But number two, you've done a lot financially to finance the, the churches, to get the churches borrowing lots of money, to get the churches learning through carrots and sticks that if they don't behave, remember they're all 501c3s. So if they get in there and start lobbying, they could lose their tax exemption. You know, you have a lot of control points now between control files on people, money, finances, tax, regulation. I mean, you know, when you speak up the way you or I do, you know, I don't know how much shadow work you've had to manage in terms of the price of speaking up. But certainly when I was in Washington, you know, I, I worked 36,000 hours for free and spent $6 million on 11 years of litigation to prove that I was clean. So, you know, if you don't have a control file, it can be very expensive to prove that you're clean. So, so I think, but, but the, there are two things that I think are the biggest obstacle to getting the pastors to stand up and do something. One is it's very hard for people to fathom that where they want to go is this demonic mm. and that the system has gotten this off track. So it, you know, it's, it's, I find people just can't fathom if you have grown up in a, in a wonderful prosperity bubble, as we have in America, you just can't fathom that, that they want to take this back to slavery. You've never been a slave. You don't understand. And you can't fathom why somebody would want to do that. That's number one. The other thing is the mind control, I think, is phenomenally effective. And it's funny because what I've watched is that as the mind control works, they become more bold and they become more bold. And one of the big problems in the system is I always say people who win in a rigged game get stupid. <laughs> and I think the blowback of the mind control being as successful as it is has made them arrogant. If you watch what Bill Gates has been doing, he's sloppy. He's really, really sloppy. So it's because he believes he, he, he's untouchable. So he doesn't right. have to be pristinely accurate because he's, you know, the, uh, we're operating through all these foundations. They're above the law. Right. They operate from a different set of rules than you and I and everybody else who doesn't operate from foundations. Right. right. And they really feel like, I mean, that, that interview that Melinda Gates did a couple of days ago about, you know, we got to do the healthcare workers first. And then we have to do all the black people and people of color. And then we have to do the elderly and the infirm first. Um, Dr. Larry Polevsky and I do a, 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 a webinar every Thursday night called Critically Thinking with Dr. T and Dr. P. And we started out by talking about this last night. And he said, what's your really take on that interview, Sherry? And I said, to me, it's a playbook. It's like, you know, let's take out everybody in the healthcare industry first. So when people get sick, there's nobody to take care of them. Right. And then, then we'll do the people of color first because, you know, we know they're useless eaters. We need to get rid of them anyways. And we need to get the elderly in the firm because they're busting the bank on their Medicare stuff. No, it's I mean, not to me, it was just, just that. You know what the elderly is? That's number two. Number two is the expense. Number one is they know too much. 
Oh, well. They have a long and deep history. And if you get the young people and the old people getting together, big problem. Because they yeah. have the map. Yeah, they have the map. So I said, it just seemed, and he was, his take on it was like, how dare somebody like her make policy? I mean, she's not a doctor. She's not a politician. She's not even a lawyer. She's not anything. And in that we are allowing the Gates Foundation and Bill and Melinda Gates, because of their money, power, control, whatever that is, to set policy on all of us. And this, all this testing <laughs> stuff we're doing where it is fault and it's fake and it doesn't mean anything. And we're creating entire policies behind it. So I'm so glad that so we you can talk about this. She's not making policy. She's just marketing it. Oh, well, she's there just you go. Marketing front. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry that she's making policy. She's just marketing it. Okay. So let me tell you why I'm an optimist and I don't underestimate the damage that can happen. You know, if you look at where we were 20 years ago, for 400, 500 years, we've had a model. Um, that model has been kind of the machine model, and financially, I call it the central banking warfare model. And that model's not going to work anymore, so we have to change the model. The model really does have to evolve, and that's a very di deep, big, complicated change. And if you're running things this centrally, you know, you have two choices. You can reinvent the model in alignment with life. The problem is you're going to have a meritocracy and then you're probably not going to be in control. And if you look at all the liabilities you have, you know, you could get killed. So, so you're not big on realigning with life or you could depopulate or you can do total control and bring out breakthrough energy. And because you have total control, you don't have to worry that it's weaponized, et cetera. So you, you know, you either do the life model, you do total control or depopulation. Those are your choices. That's what you can do. And I think they've chosen some combination of total control and depopulation, but we need to choose life. Now, the one thing we can do, because if you look at how much money they've stolen and the power they've amassed, it's quite extraordinary. But if you look at what we can do, we can bring transparency and we can offer another way, which is the living model. If you, Because if you look at doing the living model, it creates far more financial and economic wealth than anything they've got planned. So there's no reason, uh, you know, there's no reason we need to go to with their model because we need it to work. We don't. Um, anyway, my favorite story in the Bible, which everybody at the Solari Report knows, is the story of Gideon. And Gideon is called by the Lord to throw the Midianites out of Israel. And he's very negative about being asked to do this because he's like, I'm the last shepherd in the last family. You know, I'm not a soldier. I don't. Anyway, long story short, the angel makes him go through a series of steps where he brings together a group of people who are number one, faithful, and number two, competent. And, and he keeps saying, I don't have enough people. And the Lord says, look, we're going to do it, not you, but we need to work through people who are competent and faithful. You know, so we need ethical and we need efficient. So, so, so Gideon brings his army together of 300 people and he's totally nervous but they come down the side of the valley at, in night with lanterns and pitchers, so light and vibration. And the Midianites are so evil and suspicious, they jump up in the dark and kill each other. So my prediction is if we can bring transparency to what is going on, what you will find, and this has been my experience over the last 30 years, the Midianites always kill each other. Because if you look at their philosophy, they don't have a culture of philosophy that can run a planet, whether you depopulate or not. I mean, this is a pretty demonic culture that we're dealing with. You know, this is really spiritual warfare. You know, it is. And I've been saying that for quite a while now. In fact, in February, for a long time, but in February, I did a, a, a three-part interview with one of the local Christian television stations. And when I walked out of the, the station, I said, I got to sit down and write this up. You know, it's like God told me, and this is your next book, Sherry. It's called um, <laughs> Fighting Powers and Principalities, The Vaccine Battles. Right. Because, and then I've really been standing really so strongly, you know, on Ephesians 6, you know, putting on the whole armor of God. And what you find really interesting, and I did a, an interview with a pastor a while ago, and he pointed this out to me, which I thought was pretty interesting. He said, notice that all of that armor is on the front side of you. It's a shield. It's a sword because God's got your back. Right. And I thought that was like the, such a cool observation of that, of what, we're, of what we're actually doing here. 
And I started this thing on Instagram. You probably saw it. I started a new thing. It's called Happy Hour with Dr. T. And I do it, <laughs> I do it every night at six o'clock. It's about 20, 25 minutes. It's, and I've, got, I've only done it for one week. And I've already got over a thousand followers on Instagram. Wow. Well, wow. People want this. And what it is, is we get, it's happy hour. It's, I say it's happy hour in Cleveland, Ohio at six o'clock PM. Bring your adult beverage. If you don't bring, bring your coffee, your herbal tea, your glass of water. Let's sit down and talk about the Bible and, ha and pray. And that's what right. we do right. for 20 minutes. And I write. It's 6 p.m. Eastern. I got to raise my hand. 6 p.m. Eastern time. It's happy hour with Dr. T. It's, it's all spelled out with Dr. With DRT. Right. And, um, and it's really been well received and we have a great time and I write out a little thing and, and then I take all that content and I put it over on my website, which is Baxter, you know, Baxter.com. Uh -huh. Right. And so there's a tab at the top. So if people want to look at the verse or what we talked about or whatever, I'm talking double purposing the content, you know, but it's been really well received because I said, you know, there's so much negative out there. We have to create a space where people of, of spirit can come together and pray because, you know, Jesus said, any two or more of you together, I'm there. Well, last, it, almost all of these were having three or 400 people at a time. And I just started it. It was a week ago. It was last Wednesday when I started it. And this is what we need. We need to understand absolutely. that in the end, God wins. So I and always, if we're on God's team, we win, you know? Absolutely. I always make people watch the movie War Room. <laughs> Because <laughs> they say, I can't, I don't have any money. I can't do it. I said, yeah, you can go into the war room. Yeah. You, you can go in the war room because um, the thing that will bring on the Midianite thing is the kind of prayer you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. And yesterday, our, our happy hour with Dr. T was about, about the word faith. And that we use the word faith as sort of like, you know, um, you know, it's, well, we hope it happens. You know, have some faith, it'll happen. And when you look at Webster's, which made me think about this, when you look up the definition of faith in Webster's, it defines it as a noun. But faith is really a verb. It's really right. the faith the size of a grain of mustard seed to move those mountains. It's the faith that's the verb that moves the mountains. So if we so, redefine that, we, make, we become very strong. So I agree with you. I want to tell you, I often use it as a noun because one of my favorite lines from scripture is faith is the substance of things hoped for, not seen. And what I try and tell people is when you build reality, like building with building blocks, you create the blocks with your faith. It's the concrete. You pour it in and you create the building blocks that then create the reality. So you have to, that's why God responds when you stand, because this is all going to come down to whether or not we're willing to stand. And when you stand, you need to know that death is not the worst thing that can happen. Because if you know that, then you can stand. And God can't move until we stand. Yep. Yeah. I, I define faith as being like antimatter. It's the teeny tiny right. little spot. You know, right. it's like right. explosive, but it's the it's the action verb of actually doing it, of actually doing it. Right. So you know verbs can be nouns and you know words can be nouns and verbs right it's like making it a little bit more powerful so those are the things we talk about in happy hour with dr t <laughs> just kinda, you know it's just kind of make and i've had people that have sort of texted in there you know they said this has become my favorite part of the day is to just be able to have somebody and i said i think we're using a technology we're using instagram owned by facebook no less you know oh, to right. be able to reach people all around the world and people sign on there from kuwait and turkey and like all over the place that we're put we're we're able to use their tech nefarious technologies to talk about god and spread that word out you so know the real the real solutions will come from a global uh really from global networks because this comes down with any system i said we have to have new models in any financial system the question is who enforces and the reality is in the in the new models and and in alignment with life the only enforcement that really works at the end of the day is the golden rule. In other words, I have to be willing to take responsibility to be as self-enforcing as possible. Right. And then collaborate with others. Right. And so unless I'm willing, it's not just do unto others, but finance unto others as you would have them finance. So if I'm, if I'm being a perfect Christian day to day to day, but I'm making a fortune financing this kind of genocide, you know, if I'm making money, making money on the vaccines, you know, that's, that's not the golden rule. So what's going to come down is can we globally build a culture where we take responsibility to be both ethical and faithful and, and competent? 
and financially well off. I mean, we right. we have to, you know, we've we've kind of gotten into this pot of poverty mentality too. That when we, right. we talk about money, it's not good, or you know, <laughs> it, we forget it's not. It's the love of money which is defined as greed. It's not money, and we all have well, to have money to operate. Here's you know? here's the secret: when you centralize the economy, you destroy massive amounts of wealth. So the centralization process over the last 30 years, we think we're wealthier because technology has increased a whole lot of certain kinds of productivity. But in fact, the wealth on this planet is 1% of what it could be. Wow. And it was interesting. I don't know if you know this. In the, I have an online book that tells the story. But in the 90s, I created, I came out of the Bush administration. I said, these guys are going to get a hold of technology and they're going to use it to kill us all. So I have to do something. So I created an investment bank in Washington and we built software tools that would allow small business people and local leaders in a community to understand how all the federal money works and get it back lawful because so much of the money is outside the laws. When I did we called a community wizard. I had this really brilliant Chinese guy who was working for me. He was a PRC citizen and he'd come over, gone to MIT. I'd hired him out of MIT. And I asked him to do the simulations of what is possible if we could just re-engineer to optimize, and you ready for this? To optimize the money around morphogenic fields instead of around Wall Street. Wow. That's all it was. Letting the equity flow in alignment with a morphogenic field. So shared intelligence could optimize money in living systems. It's letting the living systems work. And he kept coming back to me and the number was so huge. I kept saying, Henry, that's wrong. It can't be right. You know, go back and do it again. And finally, after about the third time he said, no, you're going to take the weekend and you're going to go through my numbers. And I sat down over the weekend. I went through all those numbers and he was right. The, the wealth, the oppression of of not just economic activity, but the human spirit that comes from this kind of central control and lying because they can't tell you what they're really doing. So lie after lie after lie. And how long did it take you to understand what was really going on with vaccines? Because there's layer after layer of secrecy and lies and money and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, if you, if you could, if you could somehow arrive at a place where we're an intelligent civilization, the wealth potential is unbelievable. It's just mind boggling. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I could talk to you like forever. <laughs> I really could. Okay, and well, please I'm, promise please. me we're going to talk some more. <laughs> well, we're definitely going to talk some more. And uh, so, so the way I say it, I, I borrowed this from Caroline Casey. We're in cahoots. We're now in cahoots. Okay. Awesome. So awesome. I'm, I want to send you that financial times article. I can do a gift link on financial times. Um, and I'm going to send you a copy of our prayer book. So you nice. believe it or not, Salir has a prayer book. And there was one other thing, 6 p.m. Eastern. That's, I want to see the... Happy Hour with Dr. Ha T. Happy Hour with Dr. T. Now, please, for the Saliri folks, describe again your websites. Well, I have lots of different lots of different platforms. We do an online eight week boot camp that's offered twice a year. The next open enrollment will be September. We do something called Vaccine U, Vaccine the Letter U, which is individual courses on vaccines. We have the Ten Penny Research Library, which is over twelve thousand articles showing wow. problems of, of uh, problems with vaccines only from mainstream peer reviewed journals. So it's either links to abstracts or links to full text articles, but it's very searchable and it's uh -huh. all there. We have two different social media platforms. One is called uniting.zone and the other is called disseminate.tv. Never censored, never shut down, completely safe has been, we've been hacked, slammed so many times and they can't break it. And <laughs> I uh, they really know, can't. Historically, you know, I've done all these things on 21 trillion missing from the federal government and, you know, huge financial frauds. The times I get hacked the worst is when I do anything related to the pharmaceutical industry. Oh, I know. Guess why? It's unbelievable. So if yeah. people want to see like all of those things in one place, because there's quite a few of them instead of individual things, if you just go to courses for mastery courses, the number four mastery.com, you can mm -hmm. scroll down all the page. There's a link in there to the website about me, all of our different internet properties. And you can sort of go through and figure out what's the best for you. But I sort of okay. consolidated that so instead of giving out a bunch of individual things, which is can be overwhelming. It's just courses for mastery.com and you can find everything that we do. So if I'm in Ohio and living in, in Ohio, um, you're still practicing integrative medicine, aren't you? Yep. Yeah, and you're in Cleveland. 
yep, we have a pretty large clinic. There's right. two doctors, there's three nurse practitioners, a physician assistant. So, and we're in a, a suburb right outside of Cleveland. Yep. Okay. Well, I will say this, there's nothing more difficult than finding a really great doctor. Right <laughs> Anyway, okay, well, Dr. Sherry Tempany, it's been an absolute honor. Oh, to... This is both ways. This is a long, this is a long overdue conversation. It that's, actually that's is. True. It really is. It is. <laughs> and I look forward to it to be in connect with you more, Catherine. You've been you're, okay. you're one of my longtime heroes. I followed your work for years. So I really, really respect you. And thank you so much for having me on your okay. show with your well, with your I appreciate it. You have a great day, okay? All right. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care. Mm -hmm.